All right, we're going to go ahead and try to get started, see how this works. I have uh, some overheads to hopefully share with you today that I didn't get to do last time. Now, if you didn't get an outline last time or you weren't here last time, last time what we talked about was how uh, Old Testament saints were saved. And, of course, they were saved the same we are. By uh, Ultimately, the basis of their faith was the finished work of Christ. But what was the content of their faith? Now, you might not have been here, so if you weren't, uh, after class, I have uh, several outlines left up here from that last week. It showed how the Old Testament saints could look through their Tanakh or their Old Testament scriptures and see the promised seed and, and the progression of that Messiah who was to come and what he was to do for them. So I have those up there. Also on our website, on the uh, Sunday School page, if you look up the notes, It'll give you some of the notes from last week and the uh, notes from this week. And one of the problems with me is uh, I'm trying to get notes to Tom, but I never know how far we're going to get. So I don't want to give him five pages at one time and him put them all up there. So uh, I'll try to get them to you uh, as we go. So let me just kind of recap what we're doing. And if you want to, uh, you can turn to Revelation chapter 21. I'll read the first couple verses there. That's where we're going to be looking at. Revelation chapter 21, and we'll read verses uh, 1 and 2, or we'll, we'll just read 1 for time's sake, and we'll have a lot of scripture reading to do today, and then we'll, we'll uh, recap real quick. All right, so let's look at Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. John speaking says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away also, there was no sea. Now, we titled our, uh, our series, There's No Place Like Home. And what we're going to be studying is the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth. But before we can do that, I need to delay some foundation, uh, a foundation for us because there are some people who believe we are in the new heavens and the new earth. There are other people who believe that we are in the messianic kingdom. Uh, there are people who believe that we're in the 70th week of Daniel and all the things that happened and transpired during that time period. And so what I wanted to lay uh, down for you is um, how we view these scriptures. Now, I had mentioned to you before there are several viewpoints of the New Jerusalem. Some say, some say it's just a state of mind. Uh, and, of course, I don't believe that. I know that you don't believe that either. Some, though, say it's the church, that the New Jerusalem is actually the church. Uh, others equate it to the uh, Messianic temple that is built in the Messianic kingdom, or what some of you may call the thousand-year reign of Christ, if you use that term, the Messianic kingdom, thousand-year reign of Christ. But what I mean by that is some people mix the verses that describe the temple in the Messianic kingdom as describing the new Jerusalem, which is in the new heavens and the new earth. The problem with that is uh, these, cons these um, periods consist of different times with different characteristics. For example, let me show you something. If, as we begin to read in Revelation 21, you'll see that there's a description given for the New Jerusalem. The description for New Jerusalem is that it's 1,500 miles squared. But if you look at the Messianic Temple in Isaiah chapter 47, uh, 12 and following, you'll see that it's only four square miles. Big difference. So you either have to take those measurements literally or you have to spiritualize them and make them something different. But they're not the same. You see what I'm saying? So that's what we're going to be looking at throughout this uh, period that, that we're with. So we also talked about why people view these things differently. And the reason people have different viewpoints is because of a word that I it should be, again, in your uh, Sunday school notes on that page is because of people's hermeneutic or how they view the Scripture. That's all that means. It's a big technical term. It just means the method of interpreting Bible verses or Bible books or passages. And that there are two, basically two ways to look at things. Now, there are different nuances to these views, um, but just broadly speaking, there are two basic views. One is a Christocentric view, and that Christocentric view uh, sees the Old Testament Bible prophecies as having their fulfillment in Jesus and his work and in the church. And I referenced to you before one of the uh, proponents of that view, uh, by a guy by the name of George Eldon Ladd. And he actually tells, and I've given you uh, on our outline the uh, um, 
chapters and the pages in which he says that that is his hermeneutic, and that should be the Old Testament hermeneutic, is that you see the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecies in the person or the work of Christ. For example, when you're reading Ezekiel 40 to 48, which deal with the temple, a rebuilt temple, all the intricacies of that temple and everything, um, someone who would be reading it from a Christocentric viewpoint would not believe that it's a literal temple that's to be built in the, in the future. They would say it just describes the glories of the church. Okay? They would say, by the way, that that's what the New Jerusalem is as well. But again, these are different buildings, different contexts, and that's what I want you to see. Okay? And anytime you want to stop and in interact or ask a question, you can. But again, these uh, should be in your Bible study notes uh, that you can get online. All right, the other method that we talked about was the Christotelic viewpoint. Rather than Christocentric, it's Christotelic. That means you just read it, your Bible in a normal, literal, historical, grammatical uh, method like you would read any other book. And if it finds its end in the work of Christ, then it finds its end in the work of Christ. But that's primarily how you're reading it. Uh, the word telos is, means completion or fulfillment or end, Christotelic. So you would be reading it in a normal way and seeing if it finds its end or its goal in the work of Christ, if that's taught there. Again, even though these are closely related terms and they're differently, you know, there's different nuances to them, uh, they're, they're different, just the same. For example, in the book that I just cited, George Eldon's uh, Lad's uh, The Last Things, uh, on uh, page um, 60 and 61, he references Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, and rather than seeing uh, Christ, the Messiah, who's cut off, and then a Gentile, or a Gentile prince who comes and enforces a covenant with Israel, he sees both of those as one person, and that person being Christ. So if you're not following, pay attention, because what he's saying is, you can either, if you take this in a literal way, it could be Antichrist in the future, if you take it the way that he says, it would be Christ. So there's a big difference. See, it affects how you interpret it. It affects how you, uh, it affects how you interpret Scripture. Likewise, there's four methods that we looked at. Yes. Now, three, uh, four of the views I'm going to give you are literal. And that's what I, this is the point of what I, I want you to see. I believe that the New Jerusalem is a literal place in the future that's going to be on a literal new earth with new heavens. Okay, But there are four views, actually five, in which you can look at prophecy. Uh, one view is called the preterist view. It's a literal view. Preterist meaning last in Latin. Uh, so what they are past in Latin. So what they would say is that all or most all, a full preterist would say all or most of all of the prophecies in Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 are past. And have found their fulfillment in the destruction of the temple in AD 70. How many of you are familiar with that? But one view is the what we call the preterist view, and it means past. Most of those uh, passages um, that deal with prophecy are in the past. Uh, we then talked about how there, there's a partial preterist view. The late R.C. Sproul was a partial preterist, meaning that not all of those prophecies have been fulfilled. The second coming hasn't happened, and the resurrection hasn't happened. But uh, other than that, they would pretty much believe the same thing, that most all of those prophecies have been literally fulfilled in the past. Okay, Meaning, uh, as we, we put this up here before, and uh, I'll just show you again, just for a general reference, meaning that there is a tribulational period, a kingdom period, and the eternal state. This is what we're going to study. The preterist would say that we've passed from there to there, and this is spiritually equated with uh, the new covenant church. So we're in here already. Okay, they say it literally in in most parts, but they say it as all past. You guys got that? The preterist view. Okay. Then you have the partial preterist view. Like I said, they would believe. That we, are, that we are in the kingdom now. The kingdom is the church. Okay, It's not a literal messianic kingdom. And again, as I said, 
you'll see as we progress that there are characteristics to each of these time periods. There are characteristics to the 70th week. There are characteristics to the millennial kingdom. There are characteristics to the eternal state. And if you read those literally, then the, you'll see those characteristics. And if you don't, then you have to spiritualize those characteristics. Are you with me so far? All right, I realize this isn't the basic, uh, you know, Sunday school lesson. There's another view called historicism. Historicism. Historicism is not really that popular anymore. It used to be popular. It was popular uh, during the Reformation time. And what they do is they try to see uh, all of church history as being fulfilled in the Revelation. So people like Martin Luther and Calvin and them, uh, probably one of the um, um, groups within Christendom that still is considered uh, uh, historic, views Revelation as historic, is the Seven-day Adventists. They do a lot of conferences, and they'll always say that the Pope is Antichrist, uh, uh, Catholicism is Antichrist, and the Pope is, you know, the false prophet and that sort of thing. Okay? So they're always trying to, in history, put things as being fulfilled throughout uh, history. That's the historicism uh, view, the historic view. Then there's the futurist view. The futurist view would see the prophetic passages like Matthew 24 and 5 and Revelation 6 through 19 as future in its entirety. And then there's what we call the idealist view. This, now, these three views that I've just given you, the, the preterist view, the historic view, and the futuristic view are all literal. They would interpret it uh, uh, literally for the most part. Then there's what we call the idealist view. The idealist view says that it's not chronological. You shouldn't look for any sort of historical fulfillment in the past or the present or the future. It's just a, um, a symbol of the conflict between God and Satan, good and evil. So you're looking for just the general application. In other words, don't look for a 70th week. Don't look for an antichrist. Don't look for a kingdom and that sort of thing in a literal historical setting. Just know that there's a struggle between good and evil and good wins. That's the idealist view. But there's another view. It's called the eclectic view. And that just pretty much takes the strength from all of those views and goes with them and interprets the book of the Revelation in that way. Eclecticism or redemptive historical is a combination of all the views. They would see chapters 4 through 22 of Revelation as having some literal redemptive events, like Jesus did come, he is enthroned now, uh, and happening in the past, the present, and the future. So they combined the other ones, the uh, idealist, the futurist, the historicist, and the preterist view. And then there are, and then there are other reformed people he wouldn't be considered reformed. He's kind of on the fence, so to speak. <laughs> but um, what's the Weldon and then several others, uh, the guy who wrote our book for the New Testament. Yeah, and Bach, Daryl Bach from Dallas. Several people who used to be dispensational and have tried to go to the middle and find a middle ground to link the dispensationalists who are more literal and the covenant theologians theologians who are more redemptive, Christocentric, right? I know some of you don't get that, but uh, for those of you who read, that's kind of what it is. Yeah. In his soteriology, we would say he's reformed, meaning he believes in the doctrines of grace. Um, uh, the tulip, I hate using that word, but the tulip, John Calvin's tulip, you know, total depravity, uh, unconditional atonement, uh, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of saints. He would teach those things. So in that aspect, he would be reformed. But he doesn't baptize infants. Uh, he doesn't. He's not an amillennialist. He's more of a dispensational premillennialist, teaching that there's a, a rapture before the 70th week. So that would distinguish him from more reformed people. So that's why I said he's a sort of a mixture. You know, he's on the fence. There's the covenant group here, the dispensational group here, and he's like in the middle, right? What's that, little r? Little r reformed, yeah, right? So any other thoughts, questions before we get into the time? All right, so what does the Bible say about time? This is going to be your outline. What does the Bible say about time? 
Um, how, how is prophetic time counted, and what effect does it have on how I interpret prophecy? Okay, that's what we're going to look at this morning. Now, I need several people to read so that we can try to get through this real quick. So if we can, Dave, would you read? Would you guys like to read over there? All right, Dave, uh, take um, Matthew chapter 2, and Luke, take Matthew 25, and what, would you take one? Acts 1, verses 6 and 7, actually, both words are used there in Acts 1, 6 and 7. Bill, you want to do something? You want to do one? Matthew eight twenty I'll have you look at just a couple there. Um, somebody look up Luke, Tom Luke, chapter 19, verse 44. And then I'll have you jump over to uh, chapter 21 of Luke. There's two primary words that are used, two primary words that are used in relationship to time, chronos and kairos, right? One is a general time, chronos, chronology. It's a general time. Kairos is uh, more of a specific time or season, okay? And we'll have these uh, for you uh, probably next time on our notes. So let me... Just have a couple guys read some of the verses for you and point out. And again, you'll notice, what you'll notice in these is these are, these are prophetic passages. And so what you want to ask yourself is, are they, are they literally fulfilled or are they figuratively fulfilled? Right? So uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 7 and 16. All right, verse 16. So the exact chronos or the, the exact timing. All right? So here it's used in reference to... Uh, a prophecy that was given in Micah 2 about, the, about um, him being born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, right? Which we talked about that last time. Matthew chapter 25, 19. All right? This has to do with uh, the parable of the talents, right? Where the Lord leaves, gives responsibilities to his servants, and he's gone for a long time, a long uh, space, a long time in general. And then he's going to return and take up at accounts. All right. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. You'll see both words used here, chronos and kairos. All right. Now, usually when we talk about time and prophetic time, you'll hear people say, one to You'll usually have people who will quote Matthew 24 and who will quote Acts chapter 1 and even 1 Peter 1 and say, uh, you're not supposed to study time. We can't know the exact time when Jesus is coming, which I understand that, but that's not what we're doing. What we are doing is we're trying to be discerning about the times. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. Would you read that, Andrew? 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. And just hang on with me there. Who else had one? And Luke? Somebody have one? Tom? All right. Before the set season, before the, before the Kairos. Remember, this, these are demons. Now, what do you get just from that passage, just to see if you're on the same page as me? There, there's a specific time that the demons are aware of that they're going to be judged. Okay. Luke chapter 19, verse 44. Remember, this is when Jesus comes in on Palm Sunday and says, you did not prophetically recognize the time of your visitation, which was prophesied by Daniel and had a starting point, and Jesus now is presenting himself as king, but they didn't get it. We talked about that a little bit last week. We'll talk about it again. Uh, Luke twenty one twenty four. Who has that? Till the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. This is what this is talking about. Matthew or Luke twenty one twenty four. From the time that Babylon, you remember, in Daniel's vision, which was a Gentile nation, from the time Babylon had taken over, it's been a progression of Gentile world 
domination, basically. The Jews were the head of the nations. But then Babylon took over under Nebuchadnezzar. Then the Medes and the Persians. Then the Grecians under Alexander. Then the Roman Empire, which was founded in 753 and lasted for over a thousand years. There will be in the future a revived empire as well. And then that final empire, which according to Daniel 2, verse 44 and 45, will be the kingdom of Christ. Are you with me so far? Is this all familiar to you? Everybody know this already? All right. So that's the times of the Gentiles. That's what he's referencing there in Luke chapter 21, verse 24. Any, anybody else have a verse? Yes, First Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. Listen to what the Bible says. And uh, Tom, stay in Luke and go over to chapter 12, if you will. All right, so the, the men of Issachar were, were commended because of their understanding of the times. Listen to, uh, well, again, uh, when we looked at Luke chapter 14, Jesus confronted his generation because they didn't understand the signs of the times. Uh, listen to what it said in Luke chapter 12, verses 54 to 56. All right, so why don't you understand the signs of the times? Now, again, uh, I don't really understand why people um, shy away from prophecy when so much is said about us understanding the times in which we live. Um, the Bible says that there is a time and a season for everything under the sun, right? Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1. Uh, I had put up, and I didn't, it's still back there, I think. Um, I forgot to set it up for you. But there's a, even if you look at the Old Testament, you can see a chronological time period, sections in there. Uh, uh, let me just ask you this. Say that you're going, uh, go to the book of Matthew. Just go to the book of Matthew. Let me, let me show you something. Matthew chapter 1, the very first chapter there. Not a magic trick. Don't tell I was using my arm, though. Okay. I realize that everybody can probably see that. <clears throat> All right, you're at Matthew chapter 1, right? What's right before Matthew chapter 1? Okay, what's between Malachi and Matthew chapter 1? 400 years of silence. But does the Bible ever talk about that 400 years of silence? That's not rhetorical, by the way. That's the 400 and some odd years they were in Egypt. Or the law, the law and the promise. Where do you find... The history between this gap. If you're going to go from Malachi under the Old Covenant into the New Testament, don't you need to understand the context of the New Testament? Medo-Persia, Grecia, and the beginning of Rome. Right? Antiochus Epiphanes. Remember, Alexander dies. He has no heir. He appoints his four generals. One general from the Seleucid Empire comes to power. His name is Antiochus Epiphanes. He desecrates the Jewish temple, uh, sacrifices a pig on the altar, does a lot of vain things. The Jews recapture the temple from him and celebrate it with the Feast of Lights, which Jesus makes reference to, or the Feast of Dedication, or what we know today as what? Hanukkah. Right? So the Bible's not silent on that 400-year period. It's just God is not prophetically speaking. You see that? But if you want to understand the context of the New Testament, you have to understand what happens in between. There's a time period there that you need to study. Okay? That's also the time period that talks about the Maccabees and things of that sort. 
okay? So, we look at the Old Testament time chart. You can see how it's divided here into different sections with the, with the patriarchs, the prophets. During David's time, the princes or kings, and then the priests when, when that leads up to that New Testament era. See? So there's a, what I want you to see is there's a history. There's a, a, a literal chronological history. And there are literal events that happen within these chronological time periods. Okay? And you either have to take them as literal or you take them figuratively. And how you view them will determine what you believe about uh, the prophetic events that are to happen, that are happening, or that will happen. So you have the intertestamental periods. You have this new covenant age, which some people call the church age. You have the 70th week of Daniel, which some say is future, some say is present. You have this only, only the only um, reference as far as the uh, time. You have the Messianic kingdom being said to be a thousand years, six times in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And then that goes into the eternal state, right? So how do we count prophetic time? Well, let's look at Genesis chapter 7. And that should be on your outline there. Look at Genesis chapter 7. And I realize I'm not going to get through this, but. Genesis chapter 7. And we're going to look at Genesis chapter 7 and 8, just a couple of verses talking about the flood. And once you notice chapter 7 and verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, 17th day of the month, on that day the fountain of the great deep deeps were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. See that? Second month, 17th day of the month, 600th year. Now look at verse 24. The last one. The waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. 150 days. Now look at chapter 8 and verse 3. The waters receded continually from the earth at the end of the 150 days of the waters uh, uh, decreased. And the ark rested the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. So if you have the waters decreasing at the end of 150 days on the seventh month, 17th day of the month, 600th year, which is how many months? Five months of how many days? 30, 30 days. Now, I'm not saying, you know, I'm just saying that's how many people count prophetic time from this, prophetic, from this prophecy here, right? So you can see that again. If you want to see a fuller chronological uh, outline of the flood and what happens, you can look at MacArthur's study Bible on page 26. I think he has that there. But this is how many people count prophetic time. 30-day months, okay, 30-day months. So let's consider some of these specific times and references uh, to their nature. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. Somebody want to read that? Hebrews 1, 2. You want to read that, Carrie? And then 1 John 2, verse 18. Somebody read that, Tim? 1 John 2, 18. A lot of people will ask you, well, are we in the last days? Do you think we're close to the last days? Well, let's let Scripture answer that for us. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. That's Titus. Right? There we go. All right, the last days was when Jesus came. That was the beginning of the last days. So are we in the last days? We're in the last days. First John chapter 2 and verse 18. Now, some people will tell you there is nowhere in the Bible that a antichrist is mentioned. Right there. You have it singularly mentioned and then plurally mentioned. It is the last hour, the last time. And as you have heard, 
that Antichrist is coming, even now there are many Antichrists. Now, where would they have heard that? You have to ask yourself that question. They've heard that somewhere, that there is a Antichrist, an Antichrist coming, right? Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. Somebody got that? You guys don't want me to do all the reading, do you? Colin, you want to read that for us? Did you say Joel wanted to read one too, Colin? I thought that he did. I thought he had his hand up up here. You want to flip over to John chapter 2, Joel? Galatians 4.4. 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, the Messiah. This, again, is a prophetic scripture, and it was literally fulfilled. Jesus literally came in history, in time in history, right? All right? John chapter 2, verse 4, and you can read 7, verse 6 as well if you would. And then chapter 7, verse 6. Now, what's he talking about there? Because you can look at several other passages, and we won't, verse 8, verse 30, chapter 8, chapter 12, chapter 13, verse 1. What's he speaking about? What's Jesus speaking about there? His death. There was a certain time. Do you remember? We did that last week. There's a specific time in which Messiah was to die and a a specific way in which he was to die. Again, chronology. It's important. And if you haven't figured out why I'm doing this and hammering this so much is because you're either going to look at these chronological passages as being literal or spiritual figurative. If you look at them as literal, did they happen in the past? Are they happening now or will they happen in the future? And that's what's going to lead us into the new Jerusalem, new heavens, new earth. Okay? Listen to uh, Daniel. If you're, you're following along, I think your outline has that there. Daniel chapter 2, verses 32 and 33. Daniel chapter 2, verses 32 and 33. This, Im- this image's head was of fine gold, his chest and arms of silver, its belly of thighs and bronze, its legs of iron, its teeth partly iron and partly clay. This is Daniel giving a synopsis of what of this, this time of the Gentiles as we talked about. Verse 38, he says this, And wherever the children of men dwell, he's talking to Nebuchadnezzar, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he, speaking of God, has given them into your hand and has made you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. That's who he's talking to, Nebuchadnezzar. And we know from history, 605, 586, Nebuchadnezzar took over and ruled, and then Belteshazzar, uh, and then they were, and then he was defeated in Daniel chapter 5 by the Medes and Persians. So you know that, right? So this is the beginning, as we said, of the times of the Gentiles, the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. Now, when will this time period end? When will this time period end, this time of the Gentiles? The second coming, when the last Gentile world leader will be in control, right? Listen to, flip over if you're following along with me to Daniel chapter 7. And let me read just a couple verses out of there. Daniel chapter 7, verses 8 and 11. Daniel, as I was considering the horn, there was another another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words or great words. Verse 11 says, And I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain and its body uh, destroyed and given over to the burning flame. This is speaking of his ending. You can look at Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20 or just listen Uh, For time's sake, and I'll try to read that, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. 
uh, says this at the second coming, the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake burning with brimstone. Right? So the times of the Gentiles began with Nebuchadnezzar. They will end with this last world leader at the coming of Christ, which is, is when he will set up his, his kingdom. And you'll see that in Daniel 2, verses 44 to 48. Let me read to you just one other verse and then uh, take any comments if you have any. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 17. Jeremiah three seventeen. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne. The throne of Yahweh and all the nations shall be gathered to it to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem, no more shall they follow the dictates of their own hearts. Now, is that passage, what do you do with that passage? Because this passage tells us that the Lord will set his throne in Jerusalem and rule from Jerusalem and gather everyone to himself. You either have to take that literally or spiritually. If you take it literally, has it happened in the past? No, of course not. Is it happening now? No. No. That leaves you only one option. You either spiritualize it or it's future. And it's the messianic kingdom or you make it something else like the eternal state. The problem is those two time periods have characteristics that are different as well. Right? Do you see what I'm saying or no? Are you following me or no? I'm not sure. Let me, let me show you something here <clears throat> that might help. If you look... At the passages that talk about the millennium and the eternal state, you'll see that there are differences. The, the messianic kingdom, there's a time period given, a thousand years. In the eternal state, there is no time. Uh, the luminaries, uh, you can read in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 26, will be even brighter. In the eternal state, there will be none. The glory of God lightens the whole place. There's no need for sun or moon or stars. In uh, the Messianic kingdom, the Messiah builds a temple in uh, Zechariah 6, verses 12 and 13. The, the, uh, the whole measurements of that structure, four square miles, is given in Ezekiel 40 to 48. But in the eternal state, there is no temple. God and the Lamb are the temple. You see, there's characteristics to each of these states, whether it's the eternal state, whether it's the Messianic kingdom, or whether it's Daniel's 70th week. And you either have to take those as literal or figurative. And if you take them as literal, you've got to find out where historically they go. You see what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to get you to see. I'm not trying to get you to adopt a view that I have, but I'm, I'm wanting you to understand. I'm trying to help you, because uh, this is Sunday school, help you try to understand how um, to study the Bible and look at it and get as much as you can out of it, right? And get answers for questions that you probably have. Now, we read Matthew chapter 8 and verse 29 and found out that even the demons know that there is a time period in which they are going to be judged, right? We've seen that in Matthew chapter 8, verse 29. Um, chap if you go over to Matthew chapter 13, look at that, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13 and verse 30. Somebody wants to read that if they get there before me. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 30. Right? So there's going to be a time for the punishment of the wicked. Right? As a matter of fact, there's going to be a time of hell on earth. Look at, I do want you to see this passage. Look at Revelation chapter 9 and verse 15. Revelation chapter 9 and verse 15. And there's many more. I'm just giving you a handful of passages uh, to look at and to think through. Uh, chapter 9 and verse 15. Verse 13 says, Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the, altar, of the golden altar, which is before God, saying the sixth angel who had the trumpet um, released the four angels, who are bound in the great river Euphrates, 
So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to do what? Kill a third of mankind. Has that ever happened? Well, it's going to. If you take it literally. If you don't, you're going to have to spiritualize it. And then whoever's, then there really is no rule. Whoever you, the, the authority is whoever spiritualizes it. You can make it say anything you want to. But if you take it literally, what this text says it, it, is that there are, there are beings who are in chains right now, and they are being reserved for an hour, a month, a day, a year to be released to kill a third of mankind. Right? So you have to put that in the future. By the way, remember, these are the trumpet judgments. You have the seal, the trumpet, the bold judgments. So if you believe that you're in the 70th week of Daniel, where are you at? And I put that chart up for you before. And maybe I'll show you that one just to kind of remind you of it. <clears throat> so if we're looking at this, right, this is just what's in Revelation, just what it says. You have the unfolding of the sealed judgments, war, famine. A fourth of the population dies in chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Again, is that literal? If it's literal, when does that ever happen? A fourth of mankind. If it, if it is literal, then it, it's going to happen. You have supernatural disasters, which is, which is deemed as God's wrath. You have a parenthesis in chapter 7. Then you have the phrase, Metatata, which means after this. So you see a progression, a, chronolo a chronology after these things. John uses that and, and uh, as well as, and I saw. You see the sealing of uh, saints. You'll see the angels with their four trumpets getting ready to sound. By the time you get up to chapter 8, you have a third of the vegetation burned up, a third of the sea creatures die, a third of the fresh water struck and many die, a third of the stellar heavens kept from giving their light. Now, has that ever happened? Then either you're not in the tribulation or you're not in that part of it. If you take this literally, right? Again, there's a chronology. You have in the fifth trumpet, the abyss open, demonic beings come out and inflict people for five months. This is the first woe. By the time you get to the sixth trumpet, as we just read in 915, you have a third of mankind killed. Again, there's a, there's a chronology. After that, you have a great earthquake, which kills 7,000 people. Again, you either take these as literal numbers or you spiritualize them. And then you can make them mean anything you want. Whenever you see that term, like, like as, or as, there's your, there's your figurative expression. He's talking about a simile there. That's a good question. Yeah. And if you keep reading, though, here's the thing. If you keep reading through the book of the Revelation, many of those signs and symbols are explained to you there within the book. And if not there, remember, it has like 404 verses. Out of those 404 verses, over 250 allusions to the Old Testament uh, uh, is given. Right? It's a good question, though. Anybody else? Well, I didn't get through this. I'm sorry that I didn't get through this time period, but we'll uh, finish getting through that. And then uh, I want us to look at the structure of the book of the Revelation before we actually get into doing the new heavens and the new earth. Is there any other questions before we go? you got about five minutes, so I'm, I'm quitting early. The eternal state is looked at differently. If you, look, if you listen to Don Preston, um, Chilton, uh, who's the other full preterist? Gentry, Kenneth Gentry, thank you. That's the, one, the main one I was thinking of. Yes, what they do is they spiritualize the new heavens and the new earth with the new covenant. So we are in 
the new heavens and the new earth. It's spiritual. Okay? So they wouldn't see it as literal. 